Italy, Slovenia, Italy, Slovenia, Italy, Slovenia. It's like speed skating, Italy, Slovenia. My trainer would be happy. Italy, Slovenia, Eastern Europe. Oops, <laughs> this was Western Europe. This was Eastern Europe. Whew, that's amazing. It doesn't feel like a border. Freedom of movement. Let's go have a beer. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> We're rolling, Rob. Throughout all my travels, one concept has proven true over and over. Taking the road less traveled to unexplored areas leads to amazing discoveries. This is especially true in northern Italy, where glaciers once carved through the Veneto and Alto Adige region, giving passage to the migration of people from the south into northern Europe. From the Romans to Napoleon to the unification of Italy in the 19th century, many borders have been drawn and redrawn, but the cultures of the people have remained deeply rooted to the region. We began our trip at Il Forte Rivoli, which is on Monte Baldo, overlooking what was once a major thoroughfare for migrating people, if you were up to the journey. None shall pass. Except for every human coming from the south to northern Europe. Right down there, that pass is a natural pass that was created by glaciers that cover this area and kind of helped define this whole terrain. And we're in this area called Rivoli, which is one of the most famous places on Earth for a lot of historical reasons. The movement of, of humans happened here, the Romans, Napoleon fought a battle here, and now we're at the Forte de Rivoli, which was built in the 1880s post the unification of Italy to kind of help protect this pass. These places, when you come to them, are full of so much history, and they're connected to the people, the place, the wine. This is a, an amazing view and an amazing place and an extremely uh, moving. And right on that side is Lake Garda. Right up there is Trentino, Alto Adige, and then Austria. You can hang out at the lake, go skiing, drink wine, live life. This is pretty dope. Monte Baldo is also home to the Rowena Winery, founded over 50 years ago by the Fugatti family. Dedicated to the production of local wines, Rowena is preserving the traditions handed down by their ancestors, cultivating wild vines, producing some of the most interesting and complex wines I've ever had. Incredibly, some of the vines are over 150 years old. This is probably one of the most unique vineyards in the world I've actually ever been to. These are 150, 160 year old vines. They're, we call them pre phylloxera There's a bug that basically came from the United States and wiped out the majority of the vines in Europe, except for a few that are grown on sand. The river's right there. This is all basically just a beach. Stepping in this vineyard, it's super compelling in a kind of an emotional way, because this is an ancient varietal that's been grown here forever. And to see these vines that are you know, even older than the reunification of Italy in 1861 is, is amazing. And this is a valley kind of where armies throughout history marched up and down and migration of people up and down. It's absolutely phenomenal. These vines produce a wine that's singular to this place, these people, and the flavors are, are extremely unique. And I think that's what makes wine so interesting because these vines are history. Why can't I remember that? The only Anantio I've ever had is from your winery. Is Anantio only found in this region? Yeah. La storia dell'Enanza è una storia molto interessante perché queste viti hanno resistito all'attacco della filossera che qua è arrivato intorno al 1875. A scuola Jeff ti insegnano che eh, le viti eh, derivano tutte dal, hanno origine dal Caucaso e poi si sono sparse un po' in tutta Europa, in Francia, in Italia, in Spagna. Invece in questo caso qua la vite dell'Enanzio eh, ha un'origine genetica che è legata a delle viti selvatiche che ci sono sul Monte Baldo. So having such old vines and they're on their own rootstock, how, what does that do to, for the flavor of the wine? Beh, queste piante, beh, innanzitutto l'Enanzio, essendo una vitis, una vite silvestris, molto particolare perché si va dalle note fruttate alle note speziate. 
con questa bellissima freschezza in bocca infatti l'enanza è un vino anche da lungo affinamento in bottiglia cioè le caratteristiche che ha proprio l'uva fa sì che il vino ha cioè che il vino sia un vino che duri nel tempo one of my favorite things to do is called completing the circle so you've made this wine we're in this vineyard yeah. i really want to try this wine i've never actually been next to 150 year old vines Inantio, did I pronounce it correctly? Inantio? Inanzio. Inanzio. Salute, grazie. Salute. Mm, complimenti. Grazie. Delicioso. This is really, really interesting wine. A couple hours drive south, just past Verona, is another unexplored but historic wine region, Suave. I call it the Rodney Dangerfield of Italy because it gets no respect especially among vinophiles. Like the rest of Italy, they have been making wine for centuries, and the winemakers take the region's varietals very seriously. Piero Pan is one of the leaders. Brothers Dario and Andrea are carrying on their family's legacy of producing some of Suave's most characteristic and interesting wines, which might have something to do with being neighbors to a medieval castle. We are next to the castle of Suave. From here you can see the street, over there. On the left side, there is all the suave dock area, so the flat area. On the right side, you see all the classical area, so there is just a street able to separate the classic to the not classic. The castle has been established in the 11th century from Scaligeri family during the period of the Venice Republic. So suave, as most of the part of the Veneto region, was below the, the Venice Republic control. The classical area is the most located area and is the only one around the hillside where the viticulture is very old, I mean, from the Romans people. Where we are here is again more unique because uh, at the end uh, in Verona, which is a very is an old city from the Roman people, at the same time you can be in one hour to Venice, which is I have nothing to explain about Venice, probably. In, in the same hour, you can go to the Dolomites to ski. So it's very rich in this sense. Get a lot of uh, attractive things. And, uh, and don't forget that also on a part of the tourist could be for sure the visiting of the winery because Veneto region, and in particular Verona province, is very rich of, of winery. Valpolicella, Soave, Amarone, Recioto di Soave. So many, many types of them. Andrea and Dario's father, Leonildo, was a pioneer of Suave wines, taking the region to the next level. While staying dedicated to the traditional Suave blend of Garganega and Trebbiano, Leonildo was the first winemaker to push the boundaries of harvesting and production, producing the first oak-fermented Suave in the late 1970s from a single vineyard. This is the first Suave that was made in the barrel since 1978, when nobody believed in Suave aged, and also on the barrel. What is the idea behind using different size barrels? How does a large barrel affect uh, a wine differently than a small barrel? Because we understood in many years uh, that the blend is the, is the perfect for the, for the rum. When our father decided this project in 1978, it was exactly for this reason. So immediately he understood, and in uh, the meantime, that uh, the choice of the aging on oak took time, and then, for him, it was very difficult to, to communicate it at the client that they should wait another year. Why? Because it was white wine from the classical of Suave, so from an era of in the period of the beginning of the 80s, so when nobody was taking care that the white wine could age. So the, the pioneeristic view of our father to make this wine was done a long, long time ago. This is delicious. Thank you very yeah. much. Further east is Friuli Venezia Giulia, which borders present-day Slovenia and Austria. These two neighbors have as strong an influence on the wine, food, and culture here as Venice does from the south. In fact, depending on where you end up, people may speak Italian, or German, or Slavic, or sometimes a combination of all three. Michele, Silvia, and Felix German continue a long story tradition, which the family displays with their unique family tree. In Italy, a lot of people have a lot of family history and they have a family tree, which is, you know, usually a painting or maybe sometimes a fresco on a wall. But y'all have a, a, a family barrel tree. What is the lineage? How does, it, how does it all match up? It all starts with Anton, which is the actual founder of the winery in 1881. 
Actually, Stephanus, his father, migrated from Burgenland, yeah. which is an area in, in Austria, down to Biljana, right on the border of the Slovenian Kolio. And then himself, Anton, moved from Biljana down to Villanova di Farra, which is around 20 minutes from here, where we have our historic winery. I'm very like interested that? in Friuli, Venezia Giulia, is this just combination of all the past of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You've got the, the Balkan republics, you've got Italy. How does that influence you as, as, as individuals and as people? We lost the German language after the First World War. Basically, it used to be, we used to be underneath the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then Italy came in. But we kept all the tradition and culture from the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and you can see still here. Here, we actually have even even these barrels are from Austria, yeah. so um, from Burgenland itself, actually close to where we came from. So you know, all of these kind of like little steps that like always bring us back to our culture. Well, let's connect it all together with our Austrian barrel, Italian wine, and the family. Let's. Yeah. So let's uh, let's taste it. Chardonnay Sauvignon, Ribolla, Yeah, yeah. 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 Every terroir on the planet is unique, giving each region's wines their character. And so every great wine region names their soil. And here in Friuli, that name is Ponca. So this is our Ponca. So it's, uh, as you can see, it's very friable soil. It's uh, what gives a lot of minerality to our wines. Here, however, we have different layers. You can see that there's a harder layer in the rock and uh, there's a soft layer. So the, the typical thing about this, uh, this terrain is that we don't irrigate on the, on the hillside, only in extreme cases in the, in the summertime. But thanks to these different layers, um, the ponca traps humidity between the softer layer. The vine itself finds the humidity between these layers and can survive. This allows the plant basically to be a little bit struggle, so she concentrates the energy on fewer grapes, so fewer fruit, but then the fruit itself is more juicy, it's more delicious. Friuli, it's a small region, uh, really an undiscovered region of, of Italy, and uh, it's uh, for us a, a very special place because it's able to show to you what Europe and what Mediterranean uh, culture can be. It's a cross section of, of different countries and different traditions. Uh, my family is from Slovenia originally. We still speak Slovenian at home, uh, but we live in Italy. Uh, we studied Italian culture, we live and we, we work as Italians. And so, especially in the food culture, it's very evident this uh, cross-section of different ideas and different styles of, of taste and food. My name is Mitya Sirk. I'm from uh, Cormons, a small uh, village in the Friuli Venezia Giulia region. Nearby is the city of Gorizia, another example of the cross-section between cultures. Today, it's easy to walk across the border from Italy to what is now known as Slovenia and have a beer or a glass of wine, but that has not always been the case. So this is a, a really unique place because for 50 years or so, this exact line was the dividing line between Slovenia and Italy. Yugoslavia you, and Italy. Yugoslavia. Eastern Europe exactly. and Western Europe, yeah. What was the impact during your life for this barrier between the two worlds, even though your family's really from both places? Special after the 04, 2004, that uh, the border was open. Uh, for the people that are living here in the area, it means that changed completely the life. Uh, they are living in a, a room without windows, and then they open you a window so you can see the sun. When the, the border came down, were you, did you, was there a celebration here? Did people flock to the, the borders? Kind of like, I'm envisioning what I remember in, in 89 with the Berlin Wall coming down. Was there a, a sort of celebration of people coming back and forth? Yeah, we don't have scorpions that sing here. Right. That, that <laughs> is the wind of changing, but uh, the feeling was the same. Like, were families able to see each other? Or was there a way for people to cross the border at this time? After the Second World War, for the first 20 years, it was very difficult to do that. While you have to choose uh, after the Second World War, for uh, your first time, in which part you'd like to stay, when you have permit to stay, and then you don't have any chance to go back. Just after, after the 70s, the two states, Yugoslavia and Italy, make some agreements, Trattato di Osimo, and then you have some special permit 
to go and visit some parents, but you have to wait 20 years. Wow. Yeah. But amazing. now uh, we just uh, to understand really the feeling. We go and take a beer over the border, and then we come back to Italy. That sounds like a great <laughs> <Yeah>. idea. <laughs> beer over the border. I'm yeah, down for that. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, on the train station. No, this is. 200 years ago, Trieste was similar to what is New York today. It was the point of Austro-Hungarian Empire with so many people from different parts of Europe. And it was a very important port. We are a melting point between Austria, Italy, and the Slavic part of the Balkan. And this was a marshmallow of different culture. And this is about the language, about the cuisine, about the taste, about our story. So like with the, the cuisine of this area, is it, does it lean one way or the other more so? Or is uh, you, it, do you, if do we're you talking see... about fish, we have Venetian influence. If we're talking about pork, there's the Slavic influence. If we're talking about uh, vegetables, we have Austrian influence. And all three cuisine you find in the same area. And they'll end up on the same plate. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> While holding on to their Austrian and Slavic heritage, the Primasic family is proud to have ended up in Friuli, living an Italian lifestyle. They've maintained a focus on the native varietals of the Colio, producing wines with the precision of Austria, texture of Slovenia, and depth of Italy. Many people are asking me about the family name. What do you feel? Are you Slovenian? Are you Italian? Are you German? Well, we have all three influences inside our body. And uh, if you're talking about wine, we are part of Made in Italy. We love to be part of Made in Italy. Same uh, f uh, with the cuisine, with the style. But in mentality, we are German. If you invite me for a dinner at 8, I came 10 minutes before. <laughs> and, but if you hear what we, we speak at home, it's a mix of languages, but we're talking Slovenian. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this whole three feel uh, they are inside us. It's part of our story. It's inside uh, in, in the map. It's what we are. The thing I love about living in New York City is being in a place where so many people from different backgrounds have come, bringing their cuisine and cultures with them. Five boroughs of eight million people who've come from all over the globe crammed onto a tiny island where at the end of the day, we take great pride in the singularity of calling ourselves New Yorkers. I'm reminded of this being here in Trieste. It is one of the most unique yet undiscovered cities in Italy where you can see, hear, and taste the commonality and singular pride of a people. The richness of culture that exists is linked to their Austrian, Slavic, and Italian ancestors who came here and made Trieste their home. It is truly the jewel of the Adriatic. This is bacon pancetta, yeah, correct. Tripe, okay, testina. This right here is horseradish, classic, and this is tongue, and this is face. Yeah. Testa, head. And we've got a Refosco. A refosco. 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 Salute. I'm very I passionate about Refosco. While Trieste is the home of Refosco, but in Carso became the name of Terrano. Oh, yeah. oh, it's it's very a Refosco terrano. variety, but the name of the wine is Terrano. And Terrano, with this kind of food, it's really the heritage oh, of Trieste. This is spot on. Yeah. This is about being a traveler today. <laughs> this is discovery. This is something unexpected. I honestly had no idea. Like when you said buffet, I was like, okay. Yeah. We don't see this elsewhere in Italy because this is truly showing the confluence of everything we've talked about at Friuli. Yeah. This is Slavic, Eastern German European, influence. the the Germanic, Austro-Hungarian influence. This right here, I kind of typifies what we've talked about yeah, all day today. Really... There are no boundaries here. <laughs> no, it, no. There's no boundaries in winemaking, there's no boundaries in understanding the culture, yeah. and there's no boundaries in our ability to explore yeah. more. So and thank you very much. Well, Cheers. Grazie a voi. Thank you. Grazie thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, a Ponca salute. A Ponca salute. To no, no borders. No borders. No borders. No borders. <laughs> Ready? Everyone kind of had that screaming. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so on three. Not okay. before three or after, but on. Okay. One, <laughs> one two, three. Oh. Wow, who threw that one? Now we better run. That was awesome. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>